In the last lecture, we saw that even though historians are relatively well informed about Jesus' last days and hours, including his death, they're handicapped when it comes to talking about his resurrection. For one thing, our sources are full of discrepancies on almost every point in their accounts of what happened when Jesus was raised from the dead. And even if they weren't full of discrepancies, we'd have to take seriously the fact that these accounts were produced by people who believed that Jesus had been raised, who were retelling stories about that event that had been in circulation for several decades among believers who were using the stories in numerous instances in order to get other people also to believe. In other words, these are not disinterested accounts by outside observers. These are accounts by people who have a vested interest in the stories themselves. Even more seriously, since the resurrection of Jesus involves a miracle, that is, an event that by its very nature defies all probability, a historian, given the limits of the discipline, can never say that it probably happened. I should stress that I, I'm not saying that historians have to say it didn't happen. Historians simply don't have access to miraculous events of the past. If the, if the miracles did happen, the historian has no way to demonstrate that it happened. One thing that historians probably can say did happen, though, and can say it, in fact, with utmost certainty, is that sometime after Jesus' death, whether three days or three months or three years, sometime after Jesus' death, some of his followers began to claim that he had been raised from the dead. That much is certain. And that claim transformed our world. It might be useful to take a moment to reflect on the question of when Christianity actually began as a religion. When did Christianity as a religion come into being? We can't really say that Christianity began with Jesus preaching because Christianity is a religion that's rooted in a belief in Jesus' death for the sins of the world and his resurrection from the dead. Whereas Jesus preached about the Son of Man, who was soon to come to earth in judgment against all those aligned against God, the early Christians preached about Jesus, who had died and been raised from the dead. You see, there's a difference between what Jesus was preaching in his ministry and what Christians preached uh, about Jesus. Or to use an old formula that's been around for a long time, the early Christians appear to have taken the religion of Jesus and made it into a religion about Jesus. They took the religion of Jesus and made it into a religion about Jesus. So that we really can't say that Christianity began with Jesus' own proclamation. Nor can we say that the new religion began with Jesus' death. Because without a resurrection, Jesus' death is just another tragic death among thousands, even millions of tragic deaths throughout the history of the world. We can't say, though, that the new religion began with Jesus' resurrection, both because historians are unable to affirm on historical grounds that a resurrection happened, that is, belief in the resurrection is a matter of faith, not of historical demonstration, and because if Jesus had been raised from the dead and no one believed it, Christianity still wouldn't have started. I think what we have to say then is that Christianity began not with Jesus preaching, not with his death, and not with his resurrection, but that Christianity began with the belief in Jesus' resurrection. The first question I want to pursue in this lecture is how belief in Jesus' resurrection among his followers affected the way that they understood who he was and what he taught.
How did the fact that they believed he was raised from the dead affect what they thought about him and how they understood his teaching? To begin to answer the question, it's important to remember who Jesus' followers were. Who were these people who were Jesus' followers, who later interpreted him and his teachings? Well, we know some of them by name. Uh, we have lists of the twelve disciples in uh, two of our gospel, in several of our gospels. Uh, Mark and Luke give different lists, but some names are in common among them, and we know a few things about a few of these uh, disciples. For example, Simon Peter, James, and John, who were thought to be the three closest disciples to Jesus. We know the names of some of the others of the twelve. We know the names of several women, such as Mary Magdalene who was a, uh, a woman who was a close companion with Jesus. By the way, Mary Magdalene in the New Testament is not said to have been a prostitute. Uh, that's a later uh, tradition that floated around about her. There's nothing about her uh, in the New Testament indicating that she herself was a prostitute. Uh, later traditions indicate that she was a prostitute. Some later traditions actually indicate that she and uh, Jesus were very close to one another, so much so that some of the male disciples were somewhat jealous uh, of their relationship. La their always been traditions floating around that Jesus and Mary had some kind of uh, close, intimate, personal relationship too. All of those are legendary materials. We know very little about her except for that she was one of Jesus' close followers. We can assume that all of these people were Jesus' followers precisely because they agreed with or were persuaded by his message. That's why they followed him. This means then that even before Jesus died, his closest followers, the ones who later came to believe that he had been raised from the dead, his closest followers during his lifetime were Jewish apocalypticists. If they weren't Jewish apocalypticists, they wouldn't have had as their master Jesus who is preaching a Jewish apocalyptic message. If we want to know how belief in Jesus' resurrection affected his followers, it's significant that they were apocalypticists prior to their belief in the resurrection. The key question is, how would a Jewish apocalypticist think about the resurrection of a great man of God? They think Jesus is a great man of God. They came to think he got raised from the dead. What conclusions would they draw? I find it interesting that, that many Christians today, probably most Christians I run into who are my undergraduate students, have an extremely fuzzy notion about what it means to say that Jesus was raised from the dead. If you try and press uh, one of my undergraduates, for example, on, uh, on their belief in this, they'll, they'll believe Jesus was raised, but you ask them, what does it mean exactly? They have very unclear, unfocused ideas about it. Uh, everything from, well, it must mean that Jesus is God, and you're never sure why, you know, what's the logic? If Jesus is raised from the why does it make him God? When Lazarus was raised from the dead, does it mean that Lazarus was God? Well, I mean, you start pressing people, and they, they haven't thought about it much. Everything from that to saying, well, you know, it's hard to keep a good man down uh, kind of thing. Jesus was uh, good, and so God raised him from the dead. But not very clear notions about what, what it might mean. Well, for a Jewish apocalypticist, there wouldn't be any fuzzy notion at all about it. It'd be crystal clear what it would mean for a man to be raised from the dead. Remember what Jewish apocalypticists believed. They believed that this was an evil age, that God was soon going to intervene, overthrow the forces of evil, and bring in a day of judgment. And on that day of judgment, at the end of this age, when this age, when the time had been fulfilled for this age to end, there was going to be a resurrection of dead people. If that's what a person believes, and they come to think that Jesus was raised from the dead, they would draw an obvious conclusion. The resurrection of Jesus shows that the end of our age has begun already. This, in fact, was the conclusion that the early Christians drew. We know this because we have some of their writings. The earliest author we have in the New Testament was the Apostle Paul. 
He's writing about 20 years after Jesus' death, but he's our earliest author. It's striking what he thinks of Jesus' resurrection. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul tries to convince his Corinthian readers that there's going to be a future resurrection. Some people by this time had already begun to deny that that was going to happen. Paul wants to show that it will happen, and he does so by showing, that G, by, by showing them that since they think Jesus was raised from the dead, they necessarily have to think that there is a resurrection of the dead. In that context, Paul calls Jesus the first fruits of the resurrection. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. The first fruits of the resurrection, what does that mean? In fact, it's an agricultural image. When farmers uh, harvest their crops, the first day of the harvest, they go out, they bring in the crops, and that night they have a festival, a party. The, um, they, they celebrate the first fruits. The next day, then, of course, they go out and collect the rest of the harvest. By calling Jesus the first fruits, Paul is saying that he's the first to rise from the dead, and the rest is going to come soon. So these apocalyptic Jews naturally thought they were living at the end of time. This was confirmation of Jesus' message that the end was imminent. In addition, though, these early followers of Jesus must have found it to be uh, supremely significant that it was Jesus who was the first one raised. Jesus, then, was thought to have inaugurated the beginning of the end. The early disciples concluded on these grounds that the end had started and that God had chosen Jesus to defeat the cosmic forces of evil that were aligned against him. They thought, in fact, that Jesus had been exalted to heaven but that he was soon to return in judgment on the earth. For these people, the resurrection of Jesus just didn't mean that his body got reanimated. It meant that God had reversed Jesus' death. Death was destroyed. Jesus was brought back to life, not to die again like Lazarus or Jairus' daughter or other people in the Bible who get raised from the dead. For the early Christians, Jesus was raised from the dead, and he's not going to die again. He's in heaven now with God and he's going to come back in judgment on the earth. In other words, the belief in Jesus began significantly to affect how people understood, he, uh, how, under, how people began to understand his relationship to God, to the world, and to the salvation of the human race. Because he was raised, it changed everything these people thought about Jesus. I want to consider the changes of their views of Jesus in several ways uh, by showing you how people began to think differently about Jesus once they thought that he, he was resurrected. His followers, of course, knew that during his lifetime, Jesus had talked about God as a father, uh, the likening uh, God to a kindly parent who will give his children what they need. Once his followers came to think that Jesus got raised from the dead, they began to think that God really was Jesus' Father in a, in a unique way, that in fact Jesus was the one and only Son of God. During Jesus' lifetime, he talked about the coming Son of Man, who would arrive on the clouds of heaven in, in a mighty act of judgment against God's enemies. His followers thought, once they came to believe that he had been raised, that he himself was coming back from heaven. In other words, that Jesus was the Son of Man. During his lifetime, Jesus talked about the kingdom of God that was soon to arrive, and he evidently maintained that he would have a place of prominence in it. After they began believing in his resurrection, his followers came to think that that, that was precisely what would happen, that Jesus would reign as the future ruler, the king of the Jews, the Messiah. During Jesus' lifetime, he talked about the need to implement the ethics of the kingdom, instructing his followers that if they followed his teachings, they would already begin to experience a foretaste of the kingdom in the present. His followers came to think that the kingdom had already begun with his resurrection, that he was already its ruler now. In fact, his followers after the resurrection started thinking that he was the ruler of all things in heaven and earth, that he was the Lord of all. 
What I'm trying to show is that within a relatively brief time, when the disciples of Jesus began thinking he was raised from the dead, they started shifting the focus of their attention away from the imminent arrival of the Son of Man and the kingdom of God that was to appear onto Jesus himself, whose resurrection revealed to them that he was the Son of God, the Son of Man, the Messiah, and the Lord of all. Well, these things being said about Jesus uh, were fairly different from what Jesus evidently himself was proclaiming, at least in public. Jesus' early followers found that it was rather difficult to convince, to convince other people about these claims concerning Jesus. These followers were themselves Jews. They lived uh, as Jews. They lived among Jews. And so the people they first tried to convince about Jesus were their fellow Jews. They wanted to convince their fellow Jews that Jesus was all these things, the Son of God, the Son of Man, the Messiah, the Lord. And they found it rather difficult. We've seen already that Jews at that time had a range of expectations of what the future Messiah would be like. This, these expectations are what made it difficult for most Jews to accept that Jesus was the Messiah. Some Jews thought of the future Messiah as a great warrior figure like King David, who would take up arms against the foreign oppressor, drive him out of the land, and reestablish Israel as a sovereign state. This is a future political Messiah figure. Others saw a future Messiah as being a cosmic figure of power, who would come from heaven to destroy God's enemies. Others saw the future Messiah as a mighty priest who was authorized by God to deliver his divinely inspired interpretations of the law. In all of these cases, the future Messiah was a figure of grandeur and power. Jesus, of course, was none of these things. Jesus was widely known, insofar as he was known, to be an itinerant preacher from rural Galilee who offended the authorities and so was crucified as a common criminal. To say that this preacher crucified for crimes against the state was the Messiah struck most Jews as completely ludicrous. It struck many Jews, in fact, as being beyond ludicrous, as being blasphemous against God. Christians today tend to think that, of course, the, of course Jesus got crucified because that's what was supposed to happen to the Messiah. I need to reemphasize, though, that prior to Christianity, we have no indication that any Jew anywhere at any time thought that the Messiah was going to suffer and die, not even suffer and die for the sins of the world. There's not a solitary reference to any such idea in any pre-Christian Jewish text, including the Hebrew Bible. Why, then, do Christians assume that this is what the Jewish Messiah was supposed to do? Uh, why do Christians assume that the Messiah was supposed to suffer and die? Many Christians have difficulty understanding why Jews don't accept Jesus as the Messiah. Many of my undergraduates don't understand how Jew Jews can be so blind. Their thinking is that the Messiah was supposed to suffer and be raised from the dead. Jesus did suffer and was raised from the dead. Why are they so blind as not to accept it? What they don't realize is that Jews weren't expecting a Messiah who was going to suffer and be raised from the dead. Well, why did Christians in early, the early church say that that's what the Messiah was supposed to do if no Jews prior to that time had said so themselves? Well, it's because the early Christians believed that Jesus was the Messiah. And they knew that he suffered and died. They concluded, therefore, that the Messiah had to suffer and die. You see, it's because they believed that Jesus was the Messiah. That's why they began passing around the idea that the Messiah had to suffer, even though there weren't Jews prior to that time who thought so.
Early Christians then were in a bind when they were trying to convince Jews that Jesus was the Messiah because Jesus wasn't at all what a Messiah was supposed to be like. How did Christians deal with this problem? Well, they did what you would expect Jews to do. They started looking at their sacred scriptures to try and find evidence that what had happened was, in fact, predicted in the prophets. They couldn't find passages that said the Messiah is going to suffer and die because these passages don't exist. Christians today appeal to certain passages, such as Isaiah chapter 53, in support of the idea that the Messiah has to suffer and die, a passage that talks about the suffering servant of the Lord. Isaiah 53, which says that he was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. By his wounds we were healed. Well, that's, that sounds like what Jesus did. He suffered for us. Yes, but Isaiah 53 does not talk about the Messiah. Read the passage carefully. The term Messiah never appears there. It's not talking about the Messiah. It's talking about somebody called the servant of the Lord. Well, yeah, but that was the Messiah. Well, maybe. But Jews prior to Christianity never interpreted Isaiah 53 as referring to the Messiah who is going to suffer. In fact, the book of Isaiah itself tells you who this servant of the Lord is, who suffers for the, sakes of the, peop for the sake of the people. Isaiah chapter 49, verse 3. Who is the servant? You are my servant, O Israel, says the Lord. Israel, who suffers its exile during the Babylonians, those who are taken into exile suffer for the sake of the people. That's at least how most Jews interpreted Isaiah 53. Christians came along, though, the early Christians, and wanted to find scriptural support for their belief that the Messiah must suffer. And so they turned to passages like Isaiah 53 and said, this isn't referring to Israel, this is referring to Israel's Messiah. Jews would look at this passage and say, well, no, it's not. Well, this is where the arguments emerged. Isaiah 53 wasn't the only passage that, Jews, uh, that Jewish Christians would look at. There are a number of passages in the Hebrew Bible that refer to the suffering of a righteous man who feels abandoned by God, but whose suffering is accepted as a sacrifice for others. For example, Psalm 22. Let me quote some of the uh, verses from Psalm 22. They'll sound familiar to, pe familiar to people who know only the New Testament. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Psalm 22, verse 1. All who see me mock me. They make mouths at me. They shake their heads. I'm poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My mouth is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to my jaws. A company of evildoers encircles me. My hands and feet have shriveled. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. This is a psalm written by a person who's describing the suffering of a righteous man whose sufferings ultimately are vindicated. Even though the passage doesn't mention any future Messiah, these are all things talking about in the past or the, uh, the present tense, Christians would read these passages and say, aha, these are referring to what the Messiah was going to be like. In fact, when Christians thought about these texts, they started thinking about them in light of Jesus' crucifixion and his suffering, that these passages are referring to Jesus. As a result, when they started thinking about Jesus' crucifixion and his suffering, they started thinking about that in light of these passages. These passages helped them make sense of what had happened to Jesus. And so when they told stories about Jesus, they took phrases from these passages and put them into the accounts. And so it's no surprise, for example, that hanging on the cross in our earliest source, Mark, Jesus cries out the words of Psalm 22, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's an allusion to the suffering of the righteous man in the Psalms. Or they divide his clothes by, uh, by taking lots. Why do they do that? Because that's what the Psalms said. In other words, Christians read the events of Jesus' death 
in light of their knowledge of Scripture. Jews, though, who didn't accept these interpretations of these passages as referring to a future Messiah, disagreed with the interpretations and disagreed that Jesus then was the one. These debates between Jews and Christians have gone on for centuries over the meaning of the Jewish scriptures. They are debates that continue to go on today. My point is that the early Christians began to interpret Jesus differently once they came to believe that he was raised from the dead, and very soon they began to make exalted claims about him that they then went back to their scriptures in order to try to support. Moreover, different Christian communities developed different understandings of who Jesus was. For the early Jewish followers of Jesus, it made perfect sense to say that Jesus was the Son of Man. Jesus had pre preached about the coming Son of Man based on this passage that we saw in Daniel chapter 7, a cosmic judge who was coming from heaven in order to bring in the kingdom. What happens, though, when people talk about Jesus the Son of Man and they start telling non-Jews this? What happens when they start telling pagans that Jesus was the Son of Man, especially pagans who don't know what Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14 say. What would pagans think it mean to, means to call Jesus the Son of Man? Well, they would probably think it would mean not that Jesus was some kind of divine cosmic judge, but that he was a son of a human being. In other words, that he himself was human. That's how Gentiles came to understand the term Son of Man. It means he's human. What would Jewish followers of Jesus mean when they called him the Son of God? Well, in the Hebrew Bible, the Son of God refers to human beings who are chosen by God to mediate his will on earth. For example, King Solomon in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 14. He's the Son of God. It doesn't mean he's divine. It means he's a human who mediates God's will. Jews then would mean something like that by Son of God. What would Gentiles think if you called somebody the Son of God? Well, they'd probably think that this is somebody who's half divine. He's God's actual Son. And so Son of God for Gentiles means Jesus is divine. You see, what's happened is for Jewish communities, to say Jesus is Son of Man means he's divine. To say he's Son of God means he's human. For Gentile communities, it's just the opposite. Son of Man means that he's human. Son of God means he's divine. Uh, the, the meanings end up getting, getting reversed. Eventually, Christians came to proclaim both things about Jesus. He's both Son of Man and Son of God. By that, they meant that he's both human and divine. Already by the end of the first century, from the Gospel of John, we know that Christians are actually calling Jesus, not some kind of divine being or partially divine, they're actually calling Jesus God. By the end of the first century, Christians are calling Jesus God. This is obviously far removed from what Jesus himself ever said. Jesus was an apocalyptic prophet of the coming kingdom. The Christians came to think of him as the creator of the universe. It's an astounding difference. The various notions of who Jesus was in these various Christian communities, some mainly Jewish, some mainly Gentile in the first century, affected the way each community told its stories about Jesus. This seems to be a certain fact of history, uh, that these different communities are telling stories differently about Jesus depending on who's in the community and how they've interpreted Jesus in light of the resurrection. It's almost certain that this is happening. Otherwise, you can't explain why the stories of Jesus were changed so frequently and in so many ways. Christians who continued to be convinced that Jesus was a righteous man, but nothing more than a man, who proclaimed the imminent end of the world, would obviously remember his own sayings far differently from Christians who thought that Jesus was God himself, who could provide eternal life in the here and now. The Gospels we've inherited reflect these differences among these different communities who believe different things about Jesus. But when these different Gospels with different perspectives 
are embodied into a solitary canon of Scripture, it causes people to overlook their distinctive perspectives and to assume that these Gospels are all basically saying the same thing. By putting the different Gospels into one canon, it leads people to think that the Gospels are all saying the same thing. A historical perspective shows, though, that these Gospels each has uh, its own take on who Jesus was. This historical perspective also shows that we are unable simply to take any one of these accounts at face value as preserving a portrait of Jesus as he really was. Instead, we need to sift through each of these portraits carefully and cautiously, seeking to, to determine the actual words and deeds of the man who stands behind them all.